for today, today we talked about domain and range yesterday, right? We talked about, remember we used the idea of the, we had the combine going, right? So the domain, the, the input values that you can feed into a function, range of the output values that it's spitting out, right? Uh, we looked at some examples where you guys look at a graph and then you have to determine the domain and range from the graph. I think that assignment got, I fixed it. I think it got messed up and I fixed it, so that one's available now. It's really short, it shouldn't be a big deal. This, this, these are all pretty short assignments. Today I want to look at two other things. I want to look at average rate of change and end behavior. No big deal. So average rate of change. Rate of change, that's, uh, that's a, those are words we associate with a derivative. Right, so really all this is, I mean not driven, slope, so I'm thinking calculus. Uh, slope, right, rate of change is slope. Uh, so we want to make that connection, right. So if we're, if we're looking at some kind of a function that's, maybe it's not graphed, we're just looking at a function, like a real world function, like for example, we could look at something like price change per year. And that's the example we're going to look at in a second. We're going to look at uh, price change if we, if we have the gas prices, you know, ga the dollars per gallon, so for a given year, like in 2005, the average gas price was $2.31 a gallon. In 2012, it was $3.68. Okay, so if we're looking at something like that, let's say, we want to maybe look at how much the price is changing per year on average, right? So the way we do that is we're just going to calculate a rate of change based on the starting values and the ending values. An average rate of change is always described just by the starting values and the ending values. What happens in between is irrelevant. Okay, so for example, let's say we're going to drive to Hermiston. Uh, let's say how far is Hermiston away? Say it's 30 miles where we're going. Okay, so if it takes us a half an hour to get from PHS to Hermiston High School, uh, what's our average speed? Because really average speed in this case is just rate of change of, of distance, right? We're changing our distance with time. So speed is just an average rate of change. What's our average speed? You go 30 miles in 30 minutes. 60. 60 miles an hour, right? Are we going 60 the whole time? No, absolutely not. Our speed's changing quite a bit. but for the trip, we're starting here and ending there, and those are starting and ending values, right? And so that's what we use to calculate an average rate of change. It's useful because if we know that when we go to Hermiston, we've done this a few times, our average speed is about 60 miles an hour. That allows us to calculate, well, when do we need to leave to get to Home Depot on time or something, right? So it's, you get the idea. Okay, so then if we turn this into something mathematical, all we do to find the average rate of change for a function is we're just going to calculate the change in output over the change in input for the whole interval, right? So the, uh, we might think of that as being like if we're using x's and y's, that's going to be the change in y over the change in x. Well, what's that look like? y2 minus y1 over x2, that looks an awful lot like slope, doesn't it? Yeah. Right? If we're writing that in function notation, then that just becomes f of x2 minus f of x1. Let's say that x2 this time is for sure going to be our ending value, right? x1 is the starting value and x2 is the ending value, right? So it's just going to be the value of the function at the end minus the value of the function at the beginning divided by, you know, x2 minus x1 is how much did the input variable change during the interval, right? So if we take this example, Right here, if we want to find the average rate of change in gasoline prices from 2005 to 2012, well, I'm going to change one thing. There's one thing that's pretty dumb about this example. I don't know why we call that Y. Let's call that T, and this is going to be C of T, okay? <coughs> so then, if we want to find average rate of change of gasoline price, or, you know, average cost, or average change in price per year, well, we're starting in 2005 with that ordered pair, and we're ending in 2012 with that ordered pair, right? So what's going to be the input variable here? Is it going to be T or, or C? C. 
The input, input, input T. T. is T, right? So it's going to be the year, it's going to be the input, <coughs> right? And the output is cost. Everybody agree? So how do we calculate average rate of change? Well, average rate of change just equals change in output over change in input, right? So what's our change in output? Well, output is cost, right? So that's just going to be, how am I going to find? 3.68 minus 2.31. OK, good. Right, so that's going to be the final value minus the initial value, right? So if we're calling the initial, the initial values, if we're calling those like the point number one, right? So this is point number one, and this is point number two, well, from one to two, then that would be something like C of T2 minus C of T1. Would I agree? Whoops, there was many parentheses in there. That's a C. Right? The output here minus the output there. Right? So final minus initial over T2 minus T1. Right? Everybody see that? So this is final output minus initial I just can't spell it. output would be 2012 or yeah minus 2005. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Over final input minus initial input, right? Always that way. And so if we if we turn those into fractions then we just end up with, on the top, we're going to get 3.68 minus 2.31, right? And the units there are dollars, right? So 3.68 dollars minus 2.31 dollars. And on the bottom, we've got uh, years, right? Year 2012 minus year 2005, okay? And yeah, we get 1.37 on the top if we do that. So we get $1.37 over seven years, right? And if I simplify that, 1.37 divided by seven works out to be approximately 0.196 dollars. And the units are just going to be dollars over years, so dollars per year, right? That's meaningful. That's telling us that on average, over that interval, on average, gas prices rose by about 20 cents per year, okay? Did they rise by exactly 20 cents per year every year? No. It's going to vary, right? But over that interval, that's the average. If we wanted to make a prediction about what gas prices are going to be in 2013, based on this, well, we would probably add that much, right? Even though they varied maybe up more or less individually, the average is going to be the best guess. Okay? That makes sense? All right. So I'm going to give you an assignment. I don't have one yet. I haven't assigned one yet that does stuff like this. I'll give you one, like, you know, I'll put it up probably tomorrow. Another very, very short one where you're going to do some average rates of change given a table involving some quantities. But what I want to focus on today is just looking at a graph and determining average rate of change. Okay, because I want to make the connection between average rate of change and a slope. That's the big concept we want to hit today. So what if we want to do something like this? The average rate of change of the function over the interval x equals negative 7 to x equals 7 is what? So how am I going to do that? We said it's got to be the output, the final output minus the final input over uh, final input minus initial input, right? 
In this case, we don't have functions. We just have x's and y's, right? So output is y, input is x. Everybody agree for a function? Because we could think of this as being, right, we could think of this as being something like y equal s back r. We could think about this as being something like y equals f of x. We're inputting x values and we're outputting y values based on whatever the rule is. It gives us this kind of a curve. Okay, it's a sine function probably or something. But that's, you'll study that in the future, right? But for now, what do we have to do then? What's our, what's our initial input value? Right there, isn't it? Right, the initial x value. Did, what's initial mean? I guess I keep throwing that word out there. First, like starting and then final would be last, right? So initial versus final. So our starting or our initial value of x is negative 7, right? So what, where do I need to go on the graph then to find the initial the yeah. point corresponding to the, like the initial point on the graph. The beginning. Yeah, so where's that going to be? Tell me where to go. What are the coordinates going to be on the graph? Uh, negative 7, 2. Yeah, right there. Everybody agree? So there's, at this point, negative 7, 2. That's my initial values of the input and output, right? How about the final ones? So positive, I'm going up to x equals 7. So I'm going to go 7, negative 2. And we'd say those are our final values, right? Or why is that? Uh, because it's telling us that we're changing the function over the interval from here to there, right? So this has got to be initial, and this has got to be final because we're starting there and ending there. Oh, see what I'm saying? The x -axis. Yeah. Okay. So, right. They're they're giving us the x values. You guys calculated the y values by just looking at the graph, right? Okay. So then let's do our calculation <coughs> then. So rate of change. And I should, I really, I should say average rate of change. Equals change in y over change in x, right? So that's going to equal on the top what minus what? Negative 2 minus 2 plus 3 minus 2. Okay, but we're doing changes in y first, right? Uh, so what's our final y value? It's always final minus initial. Negative two. Good. So y2 minus 1 1 over x2 minus x1, which equals on the top negative 2, right? Minus 2, right? Okay. Divided by, what's my final x value? 7. Minus negative. What do we get? 14 on the bottom. Okay. Negative 4, negative 20. Okay. So then that's equal to, if I simplify it? 2 over 7. Yeah. Negative 2 sevenths. Okay. Would be the average rate of change over that interval. On average, I'm going to rise by negative 2 and run by 7. Okay. Did I do that the whole time? No. Not at all. But on average, that's what I did. Okay. So if I want to draw in like a slope triangle then, it's pretty simple, right? The slope triangle is just going to look like, it's going to look like this. I'm starting here and I'm ending there. So I'm going to go down. down that much, and then over that much, right? Everybody see that? So delta y or 
is negative 4 delta x equals 14. Oh, that's it, right? We're just That's all we did here is just a slope triangle, isn't it? But the points that we choose are just the, the points corresponding to the initial input and output values and the final input and output values. But otherwise, this is just a slope. You guys have already done this during our review, right? You've done stuff just like that, okay? How about this one? So what's our initial input value? X value? Yeah. Zero. Okay, so we'll go to the point zero, three is the point on the curve. When X is zero, Y is three. And then we're going up to X equals six. Looks like the point there is X equals six, Y equals three. Okay, so what's the rate of change there? Ah, okay. Zero and then six minus zero. Okay, so the average gets the average rate of change here. Should be just six, right? Uh, no. Equals change in y over change in x. Change in y is just zero, or is just three minus three, right? Change in x is 6 minus 0, <coughs> so that gives me 0 over 6. What's 0 divided by anything? Zero. 0. Right? So the average rate of change is 0, meaning it's not changing at all, which we can see. If I try to draw my slope, uh, yeah, my slope triangle here, the slope triangle, I start there, and I rise by 0, and I run by 6. That's my triangle. Right? There isn't a triangle. There's no rise, is there? And so, yeah, we'd say there's average rate of change is zero. On average, the function didn't change at all. It stayed the same. Okay. So if the first one is zero, it's always going to be right. Zero. Yeah. And what a zero on the bottom couldn't be a function, could it? Be undefined, but then it couldn't be a function because that would mean that two points lined up vertically, which they can't do, right? Okay. If we're finding the average rate of a function, rate of change of a function, you could never get a zero on the bottom by definition, right? Okay, so there's rate of change, no big deal. The other thing I want to look at is end behavior, and this is it's really simple. It's and this is we'll really probably just look at graphs for this anyway. But this is this is a concept that we'll take all the way up through calculus. In fact. I never used to talk about this at all in Algebra 2. It's just that as the common core stuff has changed, you know, this is something that we talk about now, but it's kind of cool that we do. I mean, this is, it's an easy concept, but later on, if and when you take calculus, this will be something you'll be a little bit familiar with. So end behavior, what it wants to do, the whole point of end behavior, when we talk about the end behavior of a function is, we want to know what is the behavior of the function on the extreme ends of the function. So if we go clear out to the right infinitely far or clear out to the left infinitely far, what is the function doing on those at those points, right? Uh, for example, well, okay, so there's only four possible things that could happen. Either as the ant walks to the right forever, either he's going to be going up infinitely far, which means the function would approach positive infinity, or as he goes to the right, the y values are going to go down forever, and so he's diving down towards negative infinity, or it's going to approach some, we call it an asymptote, some line, the, we saw an example of that yesterday, the function is going to approach some line, so we could get a constant value for, for the end behavior of the function, it approaches a constant y value, or it has no end behavior. If it just is totally erratic and it never does anything specific, never decides what to do, then there is no end behavior. Or if the function doesn't have ends, if it's not defined as, you know, for infinite values in either direction, if it stops, if it has endpoints, then it has no end behavior. When we say end behavior, we mean on the extremes, right? So what about this one here? Here's how we'd always write this. If we're going to talk about end behavior, we'd always start at We'd always start by saying as x approaches infinity, I'll do negative infinity first, f of x approaches what? 
as x approaches positive infinity, f of x approaches what? You fill in the blanks. So how about this one? As x approaches negative infinity, as the ant walks infinitely far to the left, what's this ant doing vertically? As he's walking to the left, he's going down, right? Forever. Agreed? We can assume that this is the this is the behavior. Of the, it's not going to change. It's not going to do something crazy like curve up out here, right? It's just doing this. So does it make sense then that we could say as x approaches, and that's what that arrow means, as x approaches infinity, uh, f of x approaches negative infinity, right? f of x really just means y, doesn't it, right? As x approaches infinity, y approaches negative, or negative infinity. Put that in the wrong one, right? That's kind of confusing. It's, it's up here, right? As x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches negative infinity. Why do we say approaches? Why don't we just say equals? Because we can't equal infinity. Yeah, you can't equal infinity, right? It's not a number. You can only approach infinity, which we kind of think of as being just go without limit to the left, right? What's the answer going to be on the other side? As x approaches infinity, so the ant's moving to the right forever, what's the y value doing? It's going up. So it's approaching infinity. Everybody agree? So we're going to get an answer there of positive infinity. Okay? How about that one? As x approaches negative infinity, f of x approaches, what, what, do, you, what do you think here? Ellen, what do you think? As x approaches negative infinity, that means we're going to the left, right? So as we go left horizontally, what are we doing vertically? So as, as the ant walks, and we're walking, he's walking on the blue function. The red line is just an asymptote, okay? So as he's walking along the blue function to the left, so horizontally as he goes left, what's he doing vertically? Yeah. That, right? He's doing one of those things. And so what would I put right there? Infinity. As x approaches negative inf infinity, f of x approaches positive infinity, right? But as x approaches positive infinity, f of x approaches what? Thank you. Okay, so Shane, what about this one? As x approaches positive infinity, think what that means. As the ant's walking horizontally to the right forever, what y value, you know, f of x is just y, what y value is he approaching? Well, it, if it were infinity, then the curve would go up like that, right? Because think what this means. This is the horizontal, so if we want to split this up into parts, this part over here is the horizontal behavior. And f of x is the vertical behavior, right? So what's the vertical behavior as the ant walks along this function forever? What's, what is his y value approaching? Four. Four. Yeah, because he's, he's getting closer and closer and closer to that asymptote. He's kind of sticking to that asymptote, right? Does he ever get there? No. That's the behavior. That's the meaning of an asymptote. It means that he never gets there, just like I never get to the door. I go back to that example, right? But I'm always approaching the door, and I get really close to it, as close as I want to get. If I just go do it for longer and longer, I always get closer, right? It's the limit of my behavior. I'm approaching the door, agreed? So here, the ant is approaching the value, looks like that has a height of 4, right? See what I'm saying? Okay. How about that one? What's wrong with that picture? So there's end points. Yeah, there's end points. So is there any end behavior here? No. no. It stops. It's got end points, right? And so that one really doesn't 
I, mean, I could never say something like as x approaches negative infinity because the ant can't walk oh, the ant can't you know, he can't walk past that point there's nothing to step on right okay make sense go grab your phone book and go